My name is David Lankus. I am the Virginia and Charles Bowden Professor of Librarianship at the University of Texas at Austin School of Information. And I'm going to talk to you about artificial intelligence. I'm probably about the 300th person who's come to talk to you about artificial intelligence. It's a big topic, and I would argue for a reason. It's having a very large impact on the information field and what I would call the knowledge infrastructure. That is how people get information, not just in how they create information, but also who creates that information and how is that information targeted towards them. When I, what I want to talk to you today is not just about sort of the flashy, let's make some pictures, which we'll do, but I want to talk a little bit more about how it impacts people on a daily basis, often without them even knowing it. There's a, going to be a lot of discussions about what happens when AI comes to libraries and what do we do when AI impacts our collections or our services or our service population. I'm here to tell you today, it's not when, it has already. As I'm going to show you, there's lots of things in which AI has changed how we think and do things, even if we haven't noticed. So what I'm going to do is start by giving you a sort of metaphors to think about it. Then we'll do some playing. I'm a little obsessed with that part. And then we'll come back and talk about its impact and how we can see it in the larger sense of narratives around librarianship and talk about really our responsibilities in this field. So with that, let's talk a little bit about the realities of artificial intelligence. And to start that, I want to give you two metaphors to think about when you think about AI's impact on libraries and really the digital sphere around us. So there are two metaphors I want you to think about. And because Percy Jackson just came out on Disney and it was such a great thing, it's in my mind, I'm going to give you two analogies that have uh, connections to Greek mythology. The first is the hydra, the multi-headed beast that when you cut one off, many more come together. And the second is the chimera. But I'll just give you a little foreshadowing. We're going to talk about some pretty serious topics towards the end. So let me just lighten the mood up a little bit. So the first metaphor I want to give you is the notion of the hydra, the multi-headed beast. Because AI is not one thing. It's not one piece of software. It's not one service. It's not one system. AI is a lot of different approaches, a lot of different organizations, different technologies, different software, different services coming together. But they all at the, have at their base, their core, with these different heads, the same concept, which is we can use digital computers to replicate different ways in which people think. Now, sometimes that's in a very limited scope, and sometimes that's broad, and one could even say that the goal is something called general AI, which is very broad. And you can think of it as a level of autonomy, right? We let the computers think for us, but we give it certain constraints only on this topic, only in building this material, only in generating this kind of information. But as I say, there are these visible heads and these invisible heads. When I started, I talked about the idea that AI is not new, that AI has been around in its, well, since computers started, but AI in its present data-driven form, the sort of big pile on by big technology has been around for about 10 years in its different approaches. Now, some of this we see, and actually, if you think about it, ChatGPT, which was only a year ago, November, was the first time that AI got a face. It's when people captured people's attention, when this technology became something we could try and we could see and we could begin to understand in a different way. But then we have this whole series of ChatGPT, Copilot by Microsoft, Gemini is Google's version, Adobe is making Firefly for images and such. But we've also been using different visible forms of AI for a long time in the voice, form of voice assistants, whether that's Apple Surrey, whether that's Google Assistant. I won't mention Amazon's one because at least 12 devices in my room will beep at me, if you know what I mean. But that's the visible part. The part we haven't necessarily seen, but frankly, is already influencing the world around us is sort of this invisible AI. This is AI that's built around large data sets and what's called deep learning, what's called machine learning, where we take huge volumes of data, whether it's numeric or increasingly textual data, image data, et cetera. We run it through a series of algorithms that are inductive in nature using Bayesian technologies and things like you know, uh, this uh, heuristic learning and Markov models and 
all of these different things. This kinds of technology where you pile a bunch of data into, the, into a computer to find its own patterns has been around for a while. If you're wearing an Apple Watch now, or you're wearing a Fitbit, for example, you're tracking your steps. You'll notice that if you have the current version of the Apple Watch, about 10 to 14 minutes into a walk, if you didn't start it, it will come up and say, hey, it looks like you're taking a walk. Do you want me to remember that? And we say, sure. That fitness algorithm, determining that you're taking a walk, determining that you're doing exercise, determining the amount of exertion you're giving, all of that comes not from simply counting bounces, but from hours and hundreds and hundreds of hours of people wearing the watch, finding patterns, and determining that this kind of pattern seems to be what happens when people walk. My wife got a new car recently, this lovely Hyundai Santa Fe, and it's very exciting. It comes with adaptive cruise control. So you can set the speed, and as you're going down the highway, if you come up to a slower car, rather than jerking to a stop or, God forbid, running into it, it slows down and it begins to pace at a certain level. The ability for the car to know that there's another car in front of it, the ability to smoothly decelerate instead of rapidly decelerating, all of that comes from, once again, hundreds and hundreds of hours of people watching people how they drive, watching people how they decelerate, et cetera, and building that into an AI system running in the car. If you're a music fan like me, and I'm a big Spotify fan, I listen to music all the time, the next song, if you're not on a playlist and you're just sort of going and saying, what's the next song, or put a radio together, or create a jam about this, comes from actually three different AI systems working together. One AI system looks at what this song is similar to other songs, looking at beat patterns, looking at different musicality. One looks at how you compare to other people, people who listened to this song tended to like this one next. One is actually natural language processing that's scraping the web for not only lyrics, but social media posts and finding out how people use this music in different areas. And all those three come together to influence what that next song is. Now, that may sound nice or interesting, but if you're like me, music influences how you feel. We're seeing this all over that the next search result you get, the next post you see on social media, these are being driven by AI. We're now seeing the idea that, for example, adaptive learning systems, whether you're using an AI coach or whether you're in a different um, certificate system in learning, where the next assignment, the next test, the next slide is based on your performance previously. AI is behind what we don't even think of as AI, from fitness, to music, to search, to social media, we have replaced the old deterministic way of doing things with these AI systems. So we see the, the heads of the Hydra, we see them invisible, which we're gonna talk about today, and certainly it's gotten our attention, but I want you to pay attention also to the invisible nature of AI that's driving how we find things, how we buy things, how we talk to each other, what we listen to, what's our next book selection, what does Amazon suggest for a purchase. All of these things are now using AI algorithms to do their work, using neural networks, for example, where you pile a huge amount of data together and you end up with these machine systems that can do human-like activities. Now, the other metaphor I want to give you, so the first metaphor is the Hydra, that idea that you have these visible heads and these invisible heads, that the visible heads and the invisible heads all share the common idea that they're using deep and machine learning algorithms, where they're working on these neural network systems, where they're inductive and based on huge amounts of data. That we're going to get into. We're going to talk specifically about generative AI in a minute. But the other metaphor I want to give you, which I think is also important, which follows up on the invisible heads, is the chimera. Now, the chimera in ancient Greece was a combination of a lion and a goat and a serpent. Don't ask me why. But actually, the metaphor I'm going using is from biology. A chimera in biology is where two different DNA systems coexist in the same organism. Now, that might sound either odd or who cares or why do I care? But let me just tell you that if you've ever had a organ transplant, you know a chimera. I, for example, have had two of them. Yay, cancer. And so to cure my cancer, the first time I replaced my own blood system, but the second time, because it came back, so my own blood system was not doing a good job, I actually used a donor. 
my bone marrow and therefore my whole blood systems from red blood cells and white blood cells and lymph cells, all that is other, are actually DNA wise, my sons. He was my donor. That means that to look at me, you'd never know that there are two <laughs> DNA systems working. You wouldn't know the difference. But if you were to take a sample, if you were to examine, if you look behind the surface, you'd actually find that there are two different, that one DNA system has replaced another one without you ever noticing. By the way, that's why if I ever commit a major crime, like a great jewel heist, I'm going to leave blood evidence so they, they collar my son. But the reason I say that is the web today, just in your normal everyday use of the web, kind of looks and feels like it has for 10 years. Yeah, the graphics get better and it gets faster, but we're still talking about web pages and search, right? Search for stuff, go to a web page, look at it. But what's happened is that's been replaced. Facebook. Oh, I, you know, I go, I go on Facebook or I go on Instagram or I go on TikTok and I see another post, and I see another post and it's a rabbit hole and that's et cetera. Or even thinking things like submitting resumes. Well, we fill out a resume and then we put it online and people examine it. And we know that these resumes can be used in different ways. All of these previous systems, web search, social media, resume filtering businesses, used a form of deterministic algorithms. They might have used lots of different variables to determine what web page to suggest or whether you were going to get a job interview, but they could be understood. And if, by the way, if you're looking for a really great piece um, on how these systems can be skewed, look for a book called Weapons of Math Destruction. Brilliant book. But in a chimera way, what's happened is while it feels the same, while it clicks the same, while it shows up on our screen the same way, all of the guts of it, all of the systems that are pushing and working have been replaced. These deterministic human systems have been replaced by deep learning AI algorithms. The next web page you see is not based on what page rank, but what an AI algorithm understands about its text and how the text fits into a larger conversation, how it expands your ideas. The next Facebook post doesn't just come because these are the next posts we give it and we want to put ads in there every so often, but it's looking and adapting to how you use it, what you respond, how long you take, etc. And even in employment, where we spend a lot of time on resume writing, these days, the resume is about less than 70% of the, re I'm sorry, more than 70% of the resume submitted to major Fortune 500 companies never get seen by a human being. They're being weeded out by these algorithms. The guts of the internet have already been changed to AI. And you may say, well, but they're all algorithms. What's the big deal? With Facebook, if you started getting the wrong images or you saw that the page rank was doing something odd, the programmers could go in and understand why you were getting different systems and they could tweak and tune them. What we've seen with AI systems is that they're opaque. These algorithms, these, um, these predictive models, these deep learning systems are not explainable. That is, it may tell you this is the next page. It may be eerily accurate, but it can't tell you why it knows that's the next page. So when it begins to do something unexpected, it's hard to identify and prevent it. As an example, recently, Google's system called Gemini that would generate images stopped generating images. They turned it off. And the reason they turned it off is when they built this system, they said, by the way, we would like to make sure that we have a little diversity in what we're doing. And so when you have a system, put in diverse actors. And then people did searches on things like the founding fathers of the United States. And they found that suddenly it was people from India signing a document. Or they were looking for Nazi soldiers. Don't look for Nazi soldiers. But they were looking for Nazi soldiers and suddenly they found black Nazi soldiers. And they found Vikings who were African-American and Native American. And what they realized was they had tried to do something good, but it had an unpredicted result and they couldn't predict it. And that's the nature of unexplainable AI. And by the way, yes, people went crazy like, oh, Google is being woke and then, you know, sort of the alt-right is looking at this as a way of eliminating whiteness. But actually it had impact, yes, on that side, but on the other side, it was a way that could be used to eliminate racial discrimination. It could be used as a way of sort of 
smoothing out the past by representing it as being much more inclusive than it once was. So to understand how these systems go wrong, that's what's different. Before you could look at it, you could sort of take it apart and figure out which part didn't work. Now it's just doing it and you're not quite sure how you're gonna go in and try it. Google's a large company. Google spent a lot of time and effort figuring out image production with this. They did not predict this outcome and they had to take it offline and it's been offline for multiple days when this is a major initiative they're trying to fix. This is difficult stuff. So to say that they, we live in a chimera internet where the guts of it have been switched out means that it has major consequences for what you're going to find in search, what you're going to find in education, what you're going to find in library systems. And we see vendor after vendor, and it will soon very much come to database vendors and integrated library system vendors and library system vendors all the time implementing AI in their systems. And we don't necessarily know what the result will be. So what I want to do, though, is it's one thing to talk about it. It's quite another to see it because we can talk about this all we want. But if you don't know what it looks like, then you're not quite sure what I'm talking about, what its potential impact is, because this is revolutionary stuff. This will change how we do things. This is a web moment. This is a 1997 moment. In 1997, we began the, the day, the year, by deciding whether we were going to be an internet world, web world, or we were going to be a fax world. Were we going to continue to look at our knowledge infrastructure as primarily analog, primarily point to point? Or was this new web thing going to become a way that we were truly going to seek out and build information? By the end of 1997, there was no more question. By 1998's dawn, we lived in a web world. That was the time when you went from, does your library have a website? How does it work? To, why doesn't your library have a website? Went from, should the government be online? To, how is the government being online and are they being transparent enough? It would go a long way to cover things like digital divide, cover things like policy. We have a long way to go still. But at that one year was a turning point. And we're at that turning point now. As I said, we're actually well past that turning point, sort of the invisible AI infrastructure. But we're now facing the sort of forward facing generative AI systems. It's going to change how we produce things. I want to give you a few examples. So first of all, generative AI, as we know it, is built around something called a large language model. Think about this as if you were building a library, you went out and you found every book you possibly could. You bought as much as you could. You got donations. You pulled them out of the, out of the trash. You just found everything you wanted. And you threw it in the middle of the room. As a human being, you would then go through classifying, separating, and putting it in stacks, et cetera. Not different from what happened here. In fact, not very different at all, because it turns out that most of these systems, OpenAI, Google, et cetera, pretty much went and found whatever they could, whether they had access to it legally or not, which is an interesting question currently in the courts. They got a bunch of eBooks, pirated eBooks, where they took in all this text. They found every image they could from every artist, whether they gave the permission or not. They found out music and they grabbed as much text as they can. It took an entire city's worth of water, a year's worth of water for one mid-sized city to run this model where they took all of that text and it first turned into millions and then billions and now trillions of decision points called nodes in these neural networks. There are patterns that says, if you see this pattern, you can predict this pattern. If you see this formation, you can predict that formation. And we've seen it in text. So ChatGPT, where you can go in and you can type something like, please give me a lesson plan next Thursday to teach math to third, year old, th third graders, and it will give you something. Or please write a letter to my patrons about closure on President's Day, and it will do it for you. But I want to show it to you in a different way in images, because images sometimes have a greater impact. So I'm gonna go, let's go play. This is, there, this is Dali. Dali is built by ChatGPT. Just like ChatGPT did for text, Dali does for images. And I'm gonna give you an example. So let's say, for example, we wanna do an advertisement or a social media post for story time. Create an image for next for, story time in my 
public library. Excuse my typing. And I'm not going to do some editing, so I apologize. It's going to take a few seconds to do this, but you know, it's doing an entire year's worth of human creativity. We'll give it 60 seconds. So it's going to take that image. And what it's doing is it's looking for things like public library. It's looking for story time. It's doing image. And it's sort of finding all the images that have that content. And then it's mashing it together in a different way. So here's two images that it's created. So we can bring them up briefly. And you can see this looks really delightful. Yay. This looks really delightful. However, those kids look awfully similar. So now this is what's different. You can do this, by the way, right now. When you pay for it, and I'm showing you the paid version, about 20 bucks a month, you can get iterative with it. In other words, conversational. So I can say things like, please make the children more diverse in the first image. And once again, if my spelling it works out, it's going to think about that. And we can go back and forth with it and back and forth with it. And we'll do it a couple more. Um, normally, if this were a live session, I'd be asking for input and we try this out um, so it doesn't quite have the same oomph to it, but you get the point. We've um, done this for things like summer story time where it creates posters for it. We've created different images, um, et cetera. So now we can see that we have more diverse. Let's add some parents to it. Once again, my spelling's not great. Um, a few things, if you try this, you'll notice that um, artificial intelligence sometimes is really stupid. Uh, so for example, if you ask it to make posters with text, it doesn't really know what text is. It just treats them as different kinds of images. And so it will grab them and put things with lots of misspellings. If you have Canva, you can actually go in and edit the text you find within it. So now we have story time with some diverse children and we have parents to it. And we could keep going. We could ask it to be more realistic. We could be asking it to be in you know, more cartoonish or more real or different library settings or whatever we want. I have to admit, this is really addictive. Um, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't show you, I'm gonna show you who's gonna do it. So this is, um, this is how I doodle these days. All of these different images are just images that I produced um, using this system. This one, for example, was um, we created a question poster. We have asked, we have read posters, that's lovely. I've always said we need question posters at the library. So this was question reality at your library. So I just asked for a library full of mythical beasts with planetary systems, and here it comes. We have things like when I'm creating images for, um, oh, here's my uh, art noir uh, uh, professor, evil professor. Um, but you'll notice, for example, the Pesser doesn't do really well. But I was able to take this into Canva. Canva now has an AI image editor and I could go in and I could literally edit the text and I could end up with this image, the professor in the case of the rotten professor. So all of these are just different queries going in, um, creating systems where you have, uh, you know, just from text, this was a intricate pocket watch on top of an ancient sextant. Um, I use these for different clocks and such. Um, you know, you can see, you know, this, I like this one a lot. This is grandfather clocks made up of grandfathers. And you could go in and edit and change it and change, I said, for example, pull out and add more to it so it creates different versions of it, make it look like a sketch. Here's a Mandela um, done in 3D. You, get, you, know, you can just have a, I'm, I'm way too many images of cows because I'm kind of obsessed with cows. So we can go look at lots of different cow figures. It's very exciting. Um, once I got done with cow etchings, we decided we needed some cosmic cows. So if we come down here a bit, we get into cosmic cows. Always have to, cows are just awesome. Um, there's a psychedelic cow here somewhere. Um, holy crap to hold my beer. I've used that for different uh, lectures before. Um, these are this is the image actually that's on the slide we just looked at, which was a middle-aged Latina woman with library uh, with tattoos on half her face generated these images. Um, these are different illustrations that I use with my class. Librarians changing the world, um, et cetera. This is the idea of having individuals orchestrate and um, coordinate different systems. So we can create all of these images and be very diverse to them. I'm going to go back to my slides now for a moment. He says, there we go. 
So what's happened here is when, once again, this AI system was grabbing all of these texts. They were also grabbing all these images. They were relating them together. They began to understand when I said woman and man and Latina, non-binary, whatever you want to put it, it begins to try and fill those systems up. I just want to show you quickly. Um, this is, let's see how this works here for a moment. This is another system, very good popular system called Midjourney. I'm just gonna show you the output. These are random images that are being produced as we speak by different people. Same system, but with different queries. What's nice about these, if you see one that you like, um, <laughs> it's a little scary. Here, this one looks innocuous. It will actually show you the query it used to create that system. So you can practice and try other people's and it's prompt engineering, et cetera, but it's really learning by doing. Let me just say that if you're interested in learning more about AI, whether it's image generation, whether it's text generation, we're gonna talk about other systems, these systems are best learned by doing. You can do lots of, lots, lots of YouTube and you can listen to old professors with bow ties, but we just play with them on a regular basis. I highly recommend you just play. So these are different systems that we can use within it. And what I wanna say about all of these systems, like I say, Google Bard is now Google Gemini, what I want to say about all of these systems is they pull from materials. They bring challenges with them. One of the challenges that they bring is that they're trained on systems. They're trained on examples they don't necessarily have access to. One of the things that we're seeing right now is a legal framework that is being built around us as we speak. I already know, for example, that based on a ruling by the Copyright Office and by different um, findings in courts, that AI-generated images or texts are not covered under copyright. You can't copyright something that doesn't have human agency as its primary developer. So all those images you just saw through um, Midjourney, for example, you can just take them and use them. Those images I created um, for, um, uh, for story time, you can use them. Any of the images you see on this slide, you can use. The other side though, from a legal, what not been legally established, and even more importantly, what has not been ethically figured out, is the origin, what fed these systems to begin with. There was a study that came out of the University of Washington and a California University, looking at, for example, these generative AI systems, primarily doing text, if they began to remove copyrighted material from its learning system. In essence, if ChatGPT was built without the use of New York Times articles. By the way, New York Times is currently suing OpenAI for using their articles. The finding of this study was that once you begin to pull out what they called sort of high-risk items, meaning items under copyright, the risk was whether they could legally do them. When you take out these highly human curated products, edited books, journalists writing articles, when you begin to pull those out, and this was my favorite thing from the news release, these models begin to suck hard. In other words, as you begin to pull out the real important human creation sides of these, these systems break apart. In fact, as I mentioned, New York Times is suing OpenAI. So our publishers are suing AI, uh, OpenAI, the company that makes ChatGPT, because once again, they feel that this work violates copyright. In the courts, we'll have to decide whether this is a transformative work, like indexing sites for web search, how this is going to fit. But before that, there's an ethical question. There's a question of, is this theft? Did people take these systems, take these images, take this text, take all of these materials and produce something really cool, frankly, but do it in an unethical way? We'll find out if it's legal, but the question is ethical. And by the way, there are systems, for example, Adobe has something called Firefly. Adobe has image generation, they're building it into Photoshop, they're building it online, where you can go in and you can do the same kinds of things, but instead of training it on the open web, they trained it on all their licensed stock art. Getty is doing the same thing. So they have not only legal, but ethical usage of materials where the artists, the photographers, the writers have been paid for their use. That's gonna be one of the questions. But we're going to need to begin to balance that with the idea of what these systems can do. What do I mean by that? On one hand, what I'm doing is fun, right? Making pretty pictures and adding pretty graphics, that's fun work. 
but imagine that we can use these same technologies to work with our communities, particularly our minoritized communities, to tell their authentic stories. Someone comes in and has a history, has a rich story to tell, but doesn't feel that they're a good writer, they can provide outlines and ChatGPT can provide scripts. They don't like their diction, they don't like their voice, they don't like whatever, you can feed them into systems that will create a human-like narration. You can then take those systems and you can create images and storyboards and videos out of that. So someone who never felt like they had the ability to write their own book, tell their own story, make their own video, can go into these systems and begin to tell their stories. And to be clear, there's lots of work, and this is where librarians come in, to make sure that when they tell those stories, they don't get whitewashed. For example, if you've asked for images of uh, women around the world, they're all these systems will generally make them smiling. Why? Because the ideal beauty is a white woman smiling, and that's the primary learning module that came in out of the United States. It's our culture being pushed on other people's ideas, right? We have to worry about that ethical side, but these tools allow people to create when they couldn't. I'm a frustrated illustrator. When I was a freshman in college, I was an illustration major. And I'll tell you all these images that I'm putting up, I dreamed of the day I could produce something this beautiful. And now I'm able to create, that's probably why I have a lot of images sitting in that photo library, because I suddenly feel like I'm able to do all my ideas and make them come back together. The question is, at what price? And that's something that we as a community need to wrestle with. And I mean that as not we as a society, I mean that we as librarians need to wrestle with that. We've always had a, let's say, interesting relationship with copyright and publishers. This gives us potentially the ability to go beyond copyright or think about redoing copyright and going beyond publishers or opening up publishing to all. But can we do that in such a way that the artist and the writer don't get penalized? Can we do that in such a way that authentic voices are not transformed into a global powered view of things? That's what we need to think about. So let me leave you with that imponderable, unanswerable question and take you into some more. I'm gonna give you a quiz because that's what I do. Can you tell which one of these images is AI generated? I'll give you a moment. I will hum the Jeopardy tune. Is it this one? Is it the, the beautiful woman with the white t-shirt? It has wrinkles in there. There's a mole. Is it the gentleman, but that mirror looks kind of funny? And what is, all right, it's a trick question. They're all AI generated, every one of them. The New York Times put out a quiz where they had people walk through 10 images. And on average, people got three right when they guessed which ones were human and which ones were human generated. It's getting hard to tell. These different models do things differently. So for example, here is me in the middle, um, uh, produced by Mr. and Mrs. Lankus. Um, that's a selfie I took outside of the barber because I was particularly happy with my beard trim. Thank you very much. I took that image through ChatGPT, uploaded the image and said, describe this for me. I took that description and I put it into three different systems. So the one in the upper left hand is called Mid Journey. And you're able to put in and say, create an image. Here's the description. And that's where it ended up. So clearly it got the beard, it got the glasses, it got the bald, it got patterned shirt, and it got a gray cloud. And it's not bad, right? The one below it is Doll E3. That's the latest Doll E one. Doll E doesn't do people very well. I mean, it's clever and it's cute, but I don't think we're going to be fooled. The, the other one is Gemini, before they took it offline, which is Google's version. And once again, there you see that diversity filter added to it, a good thing in general. And so we look at it and we go, that's not bad. I don't know where the squinty eye came from, but hey, I like the smile. Lovely, right? So each system is going to generate different images. And frankly, as you're going to play with these and learn these, and as we begin to make these services available to our our patrons, our members, our community members, we need to think about which ones because some of them are free and some of them are not free. And what do we pay for? And this is not going to be very different than how we currently choose which software to provide and what licenses to provide. We're going to get to that point because 
ChatGPT made the world change by being free, but now every system that's building these are building paid tiers to do things like, once again, that inter iterative way, which we could have built that image for story time. And so we're going to decide which ones we need to pay for. But let me talk, this is one that we know about, right? The idea, for example, if I were showing you text, we could talk about hallucinations, we could talk about whether they were mentioning things, information and disinformation. If we were talking about images, we can talk about ethical use of it, we can talk about representation, we can talk about lots of different issues, and they will all be important and are important for us to be part of those conversations. But I'd like to talk about where this is going, and I want to give you a really specific example before I do. This is what we're going to face in the very near future. The first image on the left is one I produced um, using, that one is um, Midjourney. And I really like it, <laughs> let's just be honest. I live in Texas and I have this, I grew up on like Arizona highway and the images of the desert and such. And so I was able to put basically a, uh, I think the prompt was a cowboy in, in a field with you know high mesas and massive clouds above them. But the middle one begins to talk about what we're going to face, right? This was one that I pulled around. It was shared around social media about Trump and Biden hanging out. And, you know, we're going to talk about mis- and disinformation. We've already seen, for example, uh, a AI emulating Biden's voice to try and mislead people during the New Hampshire primary. We're seeing that when um, the Republicans announced elections, they used AI images of sort of a post-apocalyptic world if you reelected Biden. We're seeing these on a regular basis. When uh, Donald Trump was going to be indicted for the first time, there were images of him being wrestled to the ground by police. These don't exist. We're seeing the idea of mis- and disinformation on steroids because now seeing is no longer believing and hearing no longer believing and reading not necessarily believing anymore. There's this whole really information literacy, spend some time on YouTube, where college students and high school students have figured out that if you go to ChatGPT to write your essay or your answer, um, there is relatively easy to predict because frankly, ChatGPT is not a good writer. It's pretty boring, pretty formulaic. And so instead what you do is you take it and you run it, the ChatGPT output, through Grammarly, and then you run it through another system which changes voice, and you go through three different or four different systems, and then when you hand it, it feels like a more authentic voice. And not only is this being used in college and high school, this is being used as people are generating books to self-publish on Amazon. Amazon Kindle, Amazon's platform for self-publishing, had to limit authors to three books a day. That is, an author could only submit three new books to be published a day. Now, not everyone's Stephen King, so these things aren't being written with a lot of hand love. And so once again, how do we build these systems? How do we deal with misinformation and disinformation? There is a, um, a political scientist named Riley Lankis. Yes, my son, but he wrote his thesis on the notion of corrosive AI. That is that AI is going to undermine trust in democratic institutions and political institutions, and it's going to do it quickly. And we're seeing that now. The ability to not only produce convincing images, but through this iterative AI, through the chat systems, in essence, being able to talk and talk back in a human-like way, being able to bring people to misinformation, bring people to disinformation at a much higher level. We're seeing already, for example, being able to use AI to create voice matches where people can find a video of someone's child grab their voice and then call them and tell them they've been kidnapped, hear the voice of their child asking them, please, please pay the ransom when in fact their child is just fine. These are the things that we're going to be dealing with. The notion of librarians playing a role in information literacy has become more and more and more important every second of the day. We need to move past crap tests and did you find the author and really begin to look at how we can affect policy, how we can affect law, how we can affect and build guardrails into these systems to ensure that these systems work ethically and support truth and the common good. And this is where it gets really scary because this last video I'm gonna show you for a moment you may have seen it. This was a year ago. 
this was AI generated video. This is Will Smith eating a lot of pasta. And just if you take 10 seconds, you'll notice it's not Will Smith, right? It's all computer generated. No one's gonna be fooled. By the way, Will Smith came out and did a really funny version himself. But what you're now seeing is what's come now. A year later, um, to OpenAI just released Sora, which is a new system they're building to do video, text to video. We've seen now text to text, please write something, et cetera, text to image. I wanna show you what text to video looks like. And this system currently builds nine second systems. These are all videos produced with a textual query. That text your query you'll see over here in the lower left-hand side. Some of them are pretty big. There were no pictures. There was no camera taken. There was no images, just a sentence. A movie trailer featuring the adventures of a 30-year-old spaceman wearing a red wool knitted motorcycle helmet, blue sky, salt desert, cinematic style, shot on 35 millimeter film. That is all that went in to making the video you're now seeing. This one has a larger text, but once again, there was no drone. No one ever left an office. No one spent hours and hours in a VFX room or millions of dollars on effects. They typed in animated scene featuring a close-up of a short fluffy monster and out this came. And as someone who sort of shared this once said, uh, it doesn't just have to be real. This is a gorgeously rendered paper craft world of coral reef rife with colorful fish and sea creatures. And once again, as someone was saying, as they shared this, this is the worst this technology is ever going to be from here on in. You're seeing errors and you see different things. This is close up of two pirate ships battling each other as they sail inside a coffee cup. This is as bad as it gets. When we first started looking at image generation in AI, we saw things like multiple arms and six fingers and it took a long time and oh, this was screwed up. And now we're seeing things where you can't tell the difference. And now we're going to be seeing the same thing with video. Those pages are doing funny things. You could kind of figure it out, but it's getting scary. What are we going to do as information professionals guiding our communities around the areas of mis and disinformation? How are we going to prepare them to be consumers of this technology, but also to be masters of this technology? When people come in to use this technology, to share their vision, to share their story, to have an authentic voice, what are we going to do to prepare them, not just for the technology of it, but for the social impact of it? And speaking of social impact, the, the other thing I wanna sort of leave you with today is talking about narratives. Because AI, artificial intelligence, is exciting and it's scary and we've gotten past the idea of talking about it taking over the world and Skynet, but now we're having to talk about taking over publishers and education. Just really quickly on education. I, uh, I teach a library foundations course, so I have library science students and every year I ask them to do a video on you need a master's degree for that. Why do you library, professional librarians need a master's degree, et cetera? There are multiple ways to become a librarian, but they're in class. I want them to do that. And um, they get up and they show them. And this year it was interesting. We started showing them, started showing them. And then one in particular stood out because it had sort of a professional narration. And the student said, he goes, you know, I, I had two instructions. He said, one was to make this video. The second was, which you gave at the beginning of class, Dave, you're free to use AI. Go ahead, I'm interested in how you use it, right? Use it, but tell me, because I want to see how it goes. He goes, the video just took me two minutes. He said, I went in to this service, and here's the URL. I typed in why a master's degree is helpful in library and information science. It generated a script. I looked at it. I agreed with what it said, and I said, go. And it spit out a five-minute video. It took him two minutes to do it. As a professor, I have to think about that, right? The old assignment of go read the paper and summarize it now is go press click and it will summarize it for you so you read the paragraph. Now you go, but that's not the same as reading. I get it. But we have to rethink how we do things now. I also wanna talk then again about narratives as I mentioned before. Right now, I firmly believe that we are at the end of the beginning of the book banning conversation that started in 2021. It's not over, it's still going, it's still going strong. 
but we're at the end of the beginning, meaning the beginning was we weren't ready. As a profession, we were not equipped to deal with this. We were not equipped to be called groomers and be seen as the villains in the story. We were not equipped with the techniques of showing up at city councils and showing up at school board meetings and taking one page out of a 300 page book and finding the explicit part and talking about parents' rights. And we were drawn into the parents' rights conversation, the narrative of parents' rights. And it was not a good narrative for us to join because it was not set up for us to join the narrative. It was set up to us to be changed by the narrative. You would see things like, you know, well, parents have a right to determine what their kids see in, in libraries. And we would say, you're right, absolutely. We've always said that. You have a right to say what your kids look at, not every kid, in which the response is, you mean it's okay for other children to see pornography, right? Nuanced conversations, we're not gonna have a great impact here. Or talking about the idea of intellectual freedom and the extremes of intellectual freedom and where do we fit this and all this stuff just was automatically negated. Right now we're seeing the resurgence of the American Library Associations, a Marxist organization telling, telling libraries what their collections should be and forcing our communities, blah, 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 blah. We're at the end of that phase because we've gotten better. We've realized that's not the narrative we want to have. So for example, now when they show up and they say, here are our 500 books, many librarians, the head of the Virginia Library Association walks into a board meeting and here's the bill for doing that because it takes how many hours of our top level people to re-look at what we've done, that's a $30,000 function. Even in Florida, where they passed the law where anyone could challenge these books, et cetera, they're now passing, the Republicans are putting in a new law that says, yeah, but only if you have a kid in the district and only five, and above that, you've got to pay for it, right? We're seeing in a legislation where we've seen legislation passed talking about you know, publishers having to rate books and which books and all this other stuff are being stopped in federal courts under First Amendment. We've moved to a new conversation. And we need, as librarians, to control the narrative because we need to get away from the idea of book banning and all of this, and we need to talk about other narratives. One narrative, and using AI, is a powerful one, particularly around workforce development. Right? There are studies that show that 86 million people are going to lose their job by 2025, World Economic Forum, and that 96 million new functions are going to be created. How do we minimize the loss and maximize gains in these new functions? How do we look at this as workforce development? Right? Because it's really hard to talk about those grooming, pedophile, liberal librarians do a fantastic job of preparing tomorrow's workforce. Right? Those narratives don't fit together. And we have the ability to put this narrative, and we have the ability to put that narrative in a fast and broad acceptance in a relatively short period of time. Once again, look at the book banning conversation. How did we in five years go from people who are helping in COVID to pedophiles and et cetera? We can build this narrative. And the AI is a strong narrative. If we can be there. It's one of the things that I've been really heartened by the response of the library community because it hasn't started with the sort of existential crisis. Oh, AI is going to put us out of business and they're all going to be chatbots, et cetera. We haven't done that. We've seen it as how can we use these tools? How can we help shape these tools? How we can make sure ethical use? How can we make sure it's representative? How can we use our collections, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Our traditional partners like publishers are having the existential crisis and they need our help in helping them find a new function of community knowledge development and how we build those together. But it's a great, powerful narrative. But here's the thing I want to talk about at AI and why it's so important. Because the same, I mentioned before how, how the web came about, how 1997 and 1998 were that web world. The web revolution, many of you aren't maybe old enough to remember that, but the web revolution was different than AI. It happened as rapidly, and it, I would argue had at least the same impact as what the AI is having. But it happened broadly. Anyone could download the software to build their own web server. And you didn't need a supercomputer. You could do it on your laptop, your old PC lying around. Anyone could make HTML pages. Anyone could share and broadcast. That's not true of how we're building these AI models. These large language models, these large systems that are doing this machine learning, who are building these billion point 
um, neural networks, et cetera. They require massive computing infrastructure. And as I say, massive ecological resources. Those data centers draw water and generate heat. They change how the environment and not in a positive way works just to build these systems. These are big systems, right? So Google, we're talking Apple, we're talking China, we're talking you know, Facebook, Microsoft. These are the people that have the infrastructure to do it. And in many cases, the same people who are building this new AI infrastructure are the same ones who built our social media infrastructure, Meta. Google and search, Apple in terms of how you use a phone and where it's everywhere, privacy, et cetera. These are the same agents that are building this technology. The same groups who substituted confrontation for connection on social media. When the whistleblowers went to Washington, what they said was the, that connection wasn't enough. People would go online to see what their friends were doing, to look at their kids, et cetera, but they weren't staying long enough to see advertisements that were what, how you monetized it. So we realized that when you're looking at someone's kids and you see a negative comment about what they're wearing or their weight or their gender or what have you, and it upsets you, you will stay to have an argument. Confrontation will keep you on that site, keep your eyes longer, and you will engage in more advertisement and more monetization. And that is separating society. And we see the impact of a separated society, of a more isolated society. This next slide is probably the most depressing slide I've ever made. Just wanted to warn you, that's why we had the pretty pictures of the Hydra at the beginning. Two economists, one Nobel uh, Economics Prize winner out of Princeton, were confused because they began looking at mortality rates and they began looking at lifespans. And if you look across the industrialized nation over a century, part of how you define an industrialized nation is the fact that lifespans go up, mortality goes down, right? You live longer, you die less, right? Um, and if you look at, for example, the United States, the age lifespan keeps going up and up and up, a little dip around 1918 because of that whole Spanish flu, World War I thing, and keeps going up and up and up and up until about the 1990s. And these economists noticed that a strange thing was happening, that white middle-aged people were dying at a hard rate, higher rate, particularly white middle-class men. And these were the people that pretty much have everything built for them to succeed, and yet they were dying at a higher rate. I'll give away the ending. It's not just white middle-aged men, it's white middle-aged women, it's black, it's Latino, it's across the United States. In fact, when they looked to figure out what was happening, the only way that they could see as a predictive factor was those with or without a four-year college degree. What they found is people without a four-year college degree were dying sooner. And then when they looked at how they were dying, it became really interesting. It turns out that lovely story of rising lifespans over centuries, primarily because we know how to deal with heart disease. Sanitation is important, but then heart disease. Many of you listening to this are probably on statins. Many of you are probably on high blood pressure medication. Many of you have a echocardiogram. If you have a heart blockage, you can get a stint or you can get a bypass surgery. We've gotten really good at keeping people's hearts going. That keeps them alive a lot longer. But suddenly this group was dying earlier but not when you think they would. Because what they found is this came from increased deaths from suicide, from drug overdoses, and from alcohol-related diseases. They came from what, they, what these economists phrased as deaths of despair. People who were isolated, primarily, once again, people without four-year college degrees across race and economic systems, were dying at a higher rate they were dying from suicide. Suicide is supposed to be from people who are highly educated and the younger. They were coming from drug overdoses and they were coming from, once again, complications of alcoholism. They were coming from deaths of despair. And when they began looking at what's going on here, what's happening, what they found out was that is happening is that people were increasingly feeling isolated, socially isolated, and they were feeling powerless. 
They were feeling like they didn't have the ability to succeed or go beyond their parents. They were finding that they didn't feel they had a voice in how the country was run, in terms of local policies, in terms of what was happening in the media and in the culture. And they were feeling disenfranchised and it was leading to despair. And so we begin to look at these things. The other thing is the Surgeon General then came out with a report and he found that social isolation, lack of connection within a community or to a strong bonding group is the equivalent of smoking 15 cigarettes a day. If you are lonely, there is a statistical higher probability you will die younger. What we are seeing increasingly in our society as we separate in different bands, if we separate in different camps, as we become more isolated and more confrontational, we're finding that it has real consequences on lifespan. And when we look at AI and we talk about AI systems, are these AI systems that can generate images and scripts and tell stories and videos going to be isolating? Or are they going to be systems that help us communicate across borders? Is this going to be a situation where my son, who's a big gamer, spends a lot of time talking to other friends in a social way of gaming online, but are we going to create more and more compelling bosses and non-player characters and scenarios and in virtual environments and et cetera that he's not going to need to talk to human beings, he can talk to a computer, and will that lead to greater social isolation? As we talk about narratives, whether it's AI, whether it's book banning, whether it's literacy, whether it's democracy, whether it's greater opportunity, I think we need to understand that part of our role as librarians, whether it's in a school, whether it's in a public library, whether it's in a university where we have students that are couch surfing and living in their cars so that they can afford tuition rates. How are we as a library knitting our communities together? The narrative that we need to talk about is not, well, we do AI too. Well, we do AI, we do searching, and here's some great books, and this is wonderful. And, oh, isn't it lovely to have this? And, oh, the love of reading. Those are great. But what we really need to talk about is how libraries knit together our community. The role of a library is to weave our communities together, to fight deaths of despair. When we're fighting for a budget or when we're fighting for why do we have this service, when we're fighting for why we have these books, the answer isn't because, well, the freedom of, of, freedom of expression and we have to have those. Those are important, but ultimately we're saving lives. The reason we have this book on trans kids is it's going to save someone's life because they're going to know they're not alone. The reason we have these books on LGBTQ is not so that we can twist and warp a child's mind, but we can show them that they are not warped and twisted. As we talk about representation, as we talk about bringing people together, this is what we do. Whether it's using AI to gather them in or whether it's teaching them how to do it so they can have more jobs, it's also tying them together. There's a small town, Gerald, Texas, population 1,200-ish. They have a library. It's a beautiful library. And every week, about six elderly women come together for a book group. And you go, oh, that's lovely. They have a book. They rarely read the book. They rarely read the book because they're too busy talking about they also happen to be recent widowers. They're talking about grief. It's a support group, right? But the library is the place they feel comfortable coming to. And the library brings them together to do that. That's what we need to begin talking about. When we tell people's story, we can use AI to generate these things. The point is to bring them together to play and learn and become empowered and then help someone else do it. What tools we use to do that and how we do it, that's going to change. But that's what we need to talk about. The reality of artificial intelligence is it's just one more field, one more concept, one more set of tools to help us save lives, to help us take people who feel disconnected from their community and the world around them and show them that they can be part of it and have power that they can create images and create videos to share their stories and then to talk about them and share and become part of them. That's what this is all about. The reality of AI is that it is impressive and it is important and it is going to change society. 
and it is up to us as librarians to ensure that that change brings us together and doesn't separate us. That those stories and creations and images and videos and texts are a way that we celebrate being together. That's what this is about. That's the reality that I want us to talk about. If you're interested in some of these concepts and you want to follow up, the first link there is something called CIRCLE, which is the uh, Collaborative Institute for Res uh, Rural Communities and Librarianship, where we study about how different issues and topics within rural communities can help, libraries can help those communities connect, find employment, find empowerment, thrive. SLATE is the State Libraries and AI, te uh, AI Technologies Program. Uh, that's where we're working with 14 different state libraries, several of them represented here today, to look at how state libraries can use and understand AI, um, counter it, embrace it, educate about it. That's what we're trying to figure out is how to use it strategically. And finally, if you want these slides or you just want to hear me spout off about other topics, that's my URL at the bottom of the Bowden Professor site. Thank you very much for your time. I look forward to the conversation to come.